Before we get started on today's show, let me tell you about the Oxford Exxon Highway 6 West there in Oxford, the Blue Sky. Get the Stadium Cups, a lot of opportunities for that now between Swayze Field and the Pavilion at Ole Miss. You get it, you take it by the Blue Sky, 49 cent fountain drink refills to quench your thirst there at the Oxford Exxon in Oxford on Highway 6 West. Also coming to you from the Clark Ford Studio, 662-257-1900, Highway 25 South there in Amory. Give Corey a call. 15 minutes. You're going to get a quote. You're going to like that quote. You're going to end up doing a deal. And when you do that, mention the podcast. You get another $500 off there at the end with Clark Ford. Now into the show. From the Clark Ford Studio in Oxford, Mississippi, MBW Digital proudly presents the Oxford Exxon Podcast. I'd say thanks for tuning in, but why am I going to give you a round of applause for something you're supposed to do, to be frank? And now, here are your hosts. Chase Parm. And broadcast school has really paid off. And Neil McCready. I deserve to be on TV. Welcome to this uh, Thursday edition of the Oxford Exxon podcast. Chase Parm, Neil McCready, Clark Ford Studio this morning. Couple of guests coming at you today. We're going to talk to Jeffrey Wright, as we do every single Thursday morning. We're also going to talk to Aaron Fitt, a uh, national writer for D1Baseball.com. We talk through everything from uh, Ole Miss to the schedule to the SEC and just a few other things uh, that come up with Aaron during about a 20-minute interview. We'll have that later on in the show. Jeffrey, uh, good appearance as always this morning. We talk plenty of Ole Miss basketball. We talk a little bit of Ole Miss baseball, and we talk about Ross Bjork. So that coming up with uh, Jeffrey as well. And a uh, packed Patterson and Earhart hotline today. Obviously, the uh, the news of the day is Ole Miss going to Auburn Arena last night, winning 60-55 to over the Tigers. They've now won 12 of the last 14 against Auburn, continuing that domination that's gone for the better part of a decade now between the, uh, the two schools. So Ole Miss picks up a huge quadrant one win, and Auburn suddenly, even though they have all these great metrics, in a little bit of a weird spot themselves. So Ole Miss... Without Blake Henson, with TD looking uh, pretty bad at times, then making a couple buckets late, they survived. Neil, they moved to uh, seven and four in the SEC, seventeen and seven overall, and they've got a very, very winnable home game on Saturday. Talk about you know as much as that Florida game kind of put everything in Paul's mode, just kind of resetting a season last night at Auburn. Yeah, I don't even know where to start. Um, first, if you had the under, uh, cash you're money, you're welcome. Uh, when two teams meet for a second time, go under if the line is high. You're welcome. And that line was really high. Um, and if you had Ole Miss and the points, it was a really good night for you. Um, so where to start? Um, By the way, before you start, because I don't want to forget this, uh, this is the second year in a row they have beat us to it and we screwed up and did not think about it. Jeffrey uh, tells us at the end of the interview that he and Calkins are uh, speaking to the sex therapist again today on Valentine's Day. We've got to do that next year. We keep getting beat by that because I forget it. And then I was like, what are you doing on the show today? And Jeffrey was like, oh, we're talking to that sex therapist. And I'm like, eh, it's brilliant. Freaking brilliant. And I just forgot. It's it's absolute genius. Yeah. We're stupid for not doing that. I know. And we're we're a podcast. We don't even have to, like, follow the FCC or whatever. We can say whatever we want. We can say what we want to say. Again, we don't buy air. I can say whatever I want. Um, I don't even know where to go buy air. I think it's in Jackson. It, the air is in Jackson? That's where you buy air? That's where you buy the air, I think. Okay. Fair There's enough. like 50,000 watts of it, or 30,000 watts of it, and so you buy you buy air by the watt. How many watts do we need? I don't know. Do you buy air by the watt or by the minute? I don't know. Or is it a combination? Is it kind of like a formula, sort of like the net? We would need a lot of watt. We would need a lot of watt. Yeah. And and we use a lot of minutes. That's fair. It could be expensive. It could be an expensive purchase. Luckily, we have a couple of sponsors, um, yeah. so we could figure that out. Okay. I don't know. I'll, I'll look into air buying um, between now and next Valentine's Day. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. Basketball. Um, all right. First of all, a shout out to Preston Broom for all, all the love to uh, to the podcast. Speaking right. about air. Okay, okay. Got that. Um, all right. Uh, who's their biggest win of the season? Um, period. That's true. Period. Abs- period. Biggest win of the season. Uh, what it says for the, the program, what it says for uh, Kermit Davis, what it says for a handful of kids, um, what it says for total buy-in, um, 
biggest win of the season. Now, if you're an Ole Miss fan, as painful as this may be, you need to be you your second favorite team the rest of the way until a scenario in which you saw them in Nashville is Auburn. And you Mississippi na- State. And uh, Mississippi State's in that mix too. But yeah, yeah. You you need Auburn and Mississippi State to win games. You 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 desperately need Auburn to win, though. You're right. Yeah, Auburn's the one where you need those son of a guns to go on a roll. Because you got two. Yeah, you need you don't need Auburn to go to Nashville and lose or something. You, you you need you need Auburn to win games now. So as painful as that may be to flip that switch, you guys, if you're an Ole Miss fan, need to flip it. Um, all right. So about Ole Miss, listen, I'm a Bruce Pearl fan. I, I, he's a he's a he's a fun coach. I think he's good for the college game. I, I've I've told the story before. Um, I was covering Alabama, and uh, Alabama played um, who was who uh, Wisconsin Milwaukee in uh, the first round of the NCAA tournament in Cleveland, Ohio, and it was cold as hell, and I wanted to go home. And uh, Privately, I was really hoping that Milwaukee could do it, and I didn't think that they could. It was a 5-12 game, and it was a pretty good Alabama team, very talented Alabama team, Mark Gottfried. And Bruce Pearl coached Mark Gottfried, coached him in circles, just coached him in circles. And I've kind of followed him since, and he won at Tennessee, and he's, he's, he's done well at Auburn, and he's very good on ESPN and all that stuff. He was so severely outcoached last night by Kermit Davis that it – it's mind-boggling, frankly. Um, not that Kermit's that good of a coach, but that he, he could out-coach another really good coach that way. It's one thing to out-coach Mark Gottfried. It's another thing to out-coach a, a really good X and O coach. And then to do it, and I don't know when they found out that they didn't have Henson. I'm going to guess sometime that day because he had what appeared to be Ole Miss stuff on at the game. When they found out they, that he couldn't go, you're already a thin team. Now you really don't have much margin for error, and immediately Terrence Davis gets fouls. Two fouls, and he sits, I don't know, the last 15 minutes of the first half, and you're having to play major minutes. And I'm not making fun of any of the following kids, but they're role players on this team. And frankly, they haven't played much. You're having to play Zach Naylor. I think it was – let me pull a box score up. I think it was 26 minutes. It doesn't sound right, but I'm going to find it. I should have had this up. I apologize. Zach Naylor plays significant minutes. Zach Naylor had scored seven points this season going into the game. This season, Chase, you had to play D.C. Davis, who's been really good. I mean, D.C.'s been really good this year. But D.C.'s a, a former walk-on who I think played six minutes last year. And, and he's playing major minutes against one of the more talented backcourts in the uh, in the SEC. And you're having to play Luis Rodriguez, who hasn't played much this season. He's had had a moment or two, but, you know, he's been a freshman uh, the whole season. So uh, here's the box. Let's see. K.J. Buffin plays 26 minutes. Zach Naylor, I was wrong, played 15. Luis Rodriguez played 15. D.C. Davis played 18, and Bruce Stevens off the bench played 23 minutes. Their bench scored 10, 12, 15 points. Terrence Davis only played 13 minutes last night. If you had told Kermit Davis before the game, uh, Terrence Davis is going to play 13 minutes and score eight points, and Blake Henson's not going to be able to go, I just don't know that even the most positive coach would have felt all that good about it on the road at Auburn arena where to give Auburn credit, they don't lose there. They're, they're, they're now 12 and two in that arena. And the only other loss was to Kentucky. I think they had lost, they won 26 over the last 28. If I have that right. Yeah. They're, they're really good there. I mean, credit where credit goes. I mean, they, they've, their fans support them. Well, their, their students are loud. They're right on top of the court. Like, like they are at Ole Miss they're, they're it's, it's, They've got to be, I mean, turning this thing around a little bit. Yeah, Ole Miss is having a really good season, but Auburn has got to be a little baffled by this domination. I mean, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's almost insane at this point because it started with Andy, it's continued with Kermit. Kermit beat up Bruce when he was at Middle Tennessee, too. I mean, it's just it's something where they cannot beat Ole Miss. 
So for Ole Miss, man, it, it just it, it's it's one of those um, cathartic sort of wins. Look, kid, 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 Paul, without doing anything crazy for him at all, is is got him right where. We know they would be in without even a doubt. This Mavs of this morning, Ken Palm has them twenty-one and ten and eleven and seven. Oh yeah, that, that, that would be. I mean, that would be just pressure free. Yeah, whatever. Go have at it. Get beat by eighty. It doesn't matter in Nashville. Listen, I don't. I wrote this in my little ten observations. Um, I don't know if you've looked at it. If they beat Missouri on Saturday, and they should, and then go to Columbia, South Carolina on Tuesday and win. They've got as good a shot as the at the four seed in Nashville as anybody. If you told me they have a hurdle left, and this is a lot of speculation, but I'm just kind of looking at the schedule a little bit. I think they're going to beat Missouri. They're going to beat Georgia at home, both those games. And then you got South Carolina on the road. I don't know, whatever. But it's hard to discount Ole Miss's road abilities right now. Jeffrey talks about that a lot coming up here in a little bit. Yeah. Is, is, I it's about just – yeah, right. It's just the fact that, you know, look, they responded after they lost four in a row and five of six by winning three in a row, probably going to win at least four in a row. It's that last game in Columbia, South Carolina, that's interesting to me in case they don't get one of those other ones they're not expected to get in the middle because they, they, they potentially have another three-game losing streak coming if they lost to Tennessee and Kentucky at home, wrapped around that road trip to Fayetteville that could go either way. But just for the sake of my conversation – they lose those three you got to get back up one more time to really put it away against Missouri that next night yeah um they're playing so well on the road that I don't think they're going to lose you don't think they're losing in Fayetteville and Columbia is your point South Carolina sorry I don't I think they're going to win one of those okay. hell they might win both of those they so should you think won- that you think they go two and one on the three remaining road games yeah they're better on the road than they are at home yeah they are. I mean, I've watched the. I've watched them play. They play with a, a different edge on the road than they do at home. I'm not saying they're a bad home team. I'm not. I'm not saying that, God, because I'm sure it'll get twisted. Because everything that can possibly be twisted now gets twisted, um, almost to the point of it being amusing. Um, but they're, they they play they play a more focused, hard edge tough-nosed game on the road than they do at home. And I don't know that South Carolina, now look, they're, they're, they're okay, but they're hitting that point in the season where their kids keep up with, with stuff on the media too, right? I mean, their kids know they're not going to the NCAA tournament. Their kids know it. If they were going to make a tournament run, it had to start last night, and it, it didn't. It, they had to do something like beat a Tennessee, and they didn't do it. Not even a little bit. And, and, yeah. and frankly, even more frustrating, kind of staying on this point a little bit with South Carolina. I mean, we're jumping everywhere, but whatever. It's talk it's okay. that everybody wants right now. Is that not? I, I'm, I'm reading this from Ben and Hip. I noticed this tweet last night. South Carolina played well. They shot 59% from three on 22 attempts and got a double double, 17 and 14 from Chris Silva, and lost by 12 last night yeah and we're down 20 a, a lot of the night um i mean good grief well number one tennessee's really really good well that's what i'm gonna dovetail and i asked jeffrey this in a minute so everybody's gonna hear the exact same thing twice but i want to get your opinion too and you did not have the um the ability to hear jeffrey's interview so in some ways that's good because you're blind to this there's thought this is topics on the message board i posed it to jeffrey i'm not going to give you his answer first Okay. How do you differentiate an SEC Coach of the Year vote right now, as of today, between Rick Barnes, Kermit Davis, and Will Wade? You know, it's funny. I was thinking about that last night because someone said Kermit Davis, Coach of the Year in the SEC, and I remember saying to myself, and I have a vote. And at the start of the year, we both said, hey, Kermit gets him in the tournament, crown him in every way ma- imaginable. Yes. Yeah, and I have a vote. Um, I actually have a vote here. Um and I asked myself, who would I vote for today? And it's down to those three. Yeah, and no for, doubt. It's one of those three. Yeah. And for the knock, on, all the knocks on Will Wade, and I hear them, and I get them, and I see them, but his team's winning, man. Um, I look at, I look at the job that Barnes has done. They've lost one time to Gonzaga, I think. 
they're they're a one seed in the tournament. They play beautiful basketball. They score at will. They defend. They play hard. It it, it it's difficult. Now they they did it last year, so you don't get. They that. were picked second in the league, and they're finishing first from a straight standpoint of that. Yeah, it's it's. I'm going to jump around here because this is what led me to think about it. So I was listening to an NBA podcast, and they were talking about the MVP voting. If you voted for MVP today, who would you vote for? And the consensus is it's down to three guys. It's James Harden, who won it last year, who's scoring at an incredible level and uh, kind of has the Rockets on his back. He's sort of doing what Westbrook did two years ago. And it's Giannis Antetokounmpo, who is – carrying Milwaukee, uh, has made Milwaukee a, a, a legitimate contender. Uh, Giannis is a, a, a two-way player. He, he, he's a post guy. He drives to the basket. He's, he's, he's an amazing, an amazing talent. And then it's Paul George with Oklahoma City, who, if the uh, voting were done today, he would win the defensive MVP. Defensive player of the year would be his in an absolute landslide. He would get maybe every first-place vote. And he's probably right now the second or third best offensive player in the league. And his, his you know, PER rating is just off the chart. And so it's how do you decide when all you could you can justify a vote for all three people. If I voted for Harden, you couldn't say, oh, Neil, you're an idiot. Or if I voted for Giannis, you couldn't say that. And if I voted for Paul George, you wouldn't go, oh, you just love the Thunder. No, you make a legitimate case for all three guys. And I thought about it with the SEC Coach of the Year. It's the same thing. I can make a legitimate case for Will Wade. Uh, they had a player uh, shot and killed in, in September. Um, a lot of teams don't rally around that all year long. It becomes, it becomes a, a, a very difficult thing to get through. Um, I can make a case for, for Barnes, obviously, because, my God, they, they, they're number one in the country. They're, they're – they're a legitimate title contender. And they, the and they have this big PR point of no top 100 players. And I mentioned this with Jeffrey. Yeah. Grant Williams offers Tennessee and Boston College. Vanderbilt did not offer him. Yeah. Well, and and, and uh, uh, Admiral uh, Schofield. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't highly recruited, really. Um, and then I look at Ole Miss. And I have the benefit of covering the program. And I know what happened with these same kids last year. These same kids last year, when they went on a losing streak, man, they folded. They folded. They they folded. They didn't quit. I didn't use that word, but they lost all confidence. There was no confidence at all inside that program last year. None. And so Kermit Davis comes in there, and he's got three good guards. And if you have guards, you can win in college basketball. And he's got three really good guards, experienced, talented guards. And he's got a couple of bigs that they, they have their moments. But, I mean, last night, Dom didn't score, had three boards. I think Bruce went for five and five. He had an okay game, but it wasn't anything dominant. Um, so that's what you get out of your post. And you bring in a couple of freshmen who have some talent, but they're freshmen, and they're not, they're not elite national recruits or anything. It's not like you went out and got Zion Williamson and, and Cam Reddish and said, here, boys. Join the join the club. Well, th- that's different. I think, I think I'm still where I thought I would be, which is, if Kermit Davis takes this team to the NCAA tournament, I'm voting for him. Because I just, it's been used against me already, and that's cool. I don't care. When I said, when they lost to Florida, I said this just isn't an NCAA tournament team. And Chase, when you watch them play with a, with an objective eye, they're not. They're not. But they win. It's like last night. They just win. There's no there's no explanation for that team winning that game last night. They just win it. And people that go, oh, well, you, you, you're just whatever. No, I mean, I'm not trying to pick on the kids, but have you watched Zach Naylor and Luis Rodriguez this year? Have you watched them this year? Because I have. Neither one of them have done anything all season to indicate that they were ready to step up in a, in a game 
at, at, a, at an arena like Auburn in a game like that and play 15 meaningful minutes each and combine to go for seven and seven. There was nothing that has happened, nothing in the course of the previous, I'm, I'm not good at math, Ole Miss is now 17 and seven. So in the previous 23 games, there was absolutely nothing to support that, that belief, nothing. So if you want to go, if you want to say, oh, well, I knew that would happen. No, you hoped that would happen and you had this faith through your red and blue glasses that it would happen. But there was nothing to indicate empirically that that was ready to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. That's fine. And so you're getting a guy like Kermit Davis that last night, to me last night was the night that, that he won Coach of the Year if, if they hold on. Now they've got more work to do. It's not done. There's, a, there's more basketball to be played, as, as you referenced. But if they get there, they get to 11-7, and 12-6, and six, and they make the tournament. Um. He's the coach of the year because he, he took a team last night and on numerous occasions, it really felt like Auburn was going to take the momentum. It felt like, okay, here comes Auburn's run. Here comes Auburn's run. All right, now here comes Auburn's run. And time after time, they'd slow it down, make a play. I thought he coached, and I wasn't there. I wish I had been there because I think I'd be able to say this better because I, I'll, I'll watch him coach sometimes. And sometimes he coaches, he coaches with a foot up your ass. You know what I mean? I mean he's 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 on you. I thought last night there was more. Hey, we're all in this. We're, not that he's never this way, but you understand what I'm saying. It, it was more of a, come on, we can do this, we can do this. But you could tell, man, we're just milking clock. We're just trying to get to the finish line. And they they believe in him. They absolutely believe in him. They they would they would follow him off the cliff right now, and and that's not a knock on Andy Kennedy. It's not a knock on anybody that's been there before. It's just the guy has done something that the only people who predicted Ole Miss to the NCAA tournament this year are the people who predict Ole Miss to the NCAA tournament every year. And if you pick them there every year, it doesn't count when you luck into getting it right. Yeah. No, nope, nobody outside of that locker room, and dude, I mean nobody, nobody outside of that locker room, nobody thought this team could do this. I picked them to finish 13th out of 14th. Got no pushback at all. I wrote a preseason thing where I predicted them to go seven and 11 in the league, and people at Ole Miss inside the program told me they thought that was fair. Now I, I'm 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 waiting for the you guys and all that stuff that's coming, but cause that's just the way that's just the way it works when, when this stuff happens, but nobody at the time, no, not one person in November said, Hey, you watch, you watch. And when they lost five out of six or four out of five, whatever it was, five out of six, I think yeah, it was five out of six. when they lost five out of six, you started hearing a little bit of that. Hey, it's your one. Year one, some of the PR, it was smart. But apparently inside that program, that's not what happened. Inside that program, there was a push. There was a, they hit some buttons different. And they've played different. And those those last six minutes against Texas A&M, I think we're going to look back and go, that's where the season turned. Yeah, I was uh, I was kind of laughing because you could tell Kermit's just looking at the clock going, go, 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 go. It, it reminded me of the movie Miracle where they're playing the Russians and Herb Brooks is like, just kind of like look it up and it's like four minutes, three minutes, two minutes. And like, you, 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 cause you think this inevitability is coming and it just never comes and the clock runs out and you win the game. And it's sort of what, uh, it's what sort of what last night felt like for, uh, for Ole Miss. And then the yeah. last minute, you know, Bruce Pearl kind of makes some errors there and it is what it is, but nonetheless, um, yeah, he, he did, he did some quick math and then he realized the math wasn't good. I think, yeah. I think, I think what happened was they looked at it and he thought well, there's a six, seven second differential. Let's just play defense. And then when I think when he realized it was like three and a half second differential. Not like, good, yeah. And you, fi- you foul the one guy that you know is going to make the free throws. I mean, yeah. you know, Terrence Davis missed a couple of free throws late. I mean, there were – it's not like – that's my point, man. I mean, there were moments like T- Terrence misses those free throws. Auburn goes down, gets fouled, goes to the line, makes a couple of, uh, of free throws, I think cuts it to two or three. And you look up and Ole Miss has – uh, Schuler's got four fouls. Uh, 
TD obviously has four fouls. I think Stevens had four fouls. I'm looking to see on fouls real quick. Um, yeah, Bruce had four fouls. I mean, Ole Miss was – they overtime did not favor the Rebels. I mean, you know what I mean? It, it was – I. I'm kind of, I'm still kind of floored. I watched it, and look, it's not a major upset. I mean, they, they both teams were 16 and seven going in, so, but, but, I'm, I didn't see that one coming. Neither did Vegas. Eight and a half is a pretty big line. Uh, I just didn't see it. And if you, and when, and when I saw that Henson wasn't playing, I thought, man, I don't know. And then TD goes down, and you think, or goes out. When he went out the second time with like 16 minutes to go in the game, I thought they, there's just not enough. They don't have enough to hold on against these guys. And then, you know, Okiki, who's a hell of a player for Auburn. I mean, it's not like Auburn didn't play. I and mean, they didn't get some of the guard play they normally get. But Okiki goes for 23 and 11, Chase. You know what I mean? They get 10 from Harper. They, 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 uh, the job that, that they did defensively on Brown probably was the biggest story of the game. There's just a lot there. It was a huge win, and at the end of the season, if, if they're in the tournament, that's one of the games we'll definitely be talking about. Yeah, we're going to go to Jeffrey in a minute to uh, hear a lot from him. Jeffrey, really, really good today, so hang in for that in a second. Before we do that, I'll tell you about Scripted Jewelry, scriptedjewelry.com. Go to the website, see all the different options. I'm seeing things bought in Florida, even Mantachi, Mississippi. That might have been a Rebel Grove person. Uh, West Laco, Texas, getting a, a Madison pendant silver as I'm reading off the site. Again, whatever you need, they've got it there for you. Turnaround times are great, and they will take care of you with a great selection and ability to put your special message on that special item for someone in your life. Maybe you took advantage of it for Valentine's Day, and that thing is being opened today by the person in your life. So, again, when you check out, use Rebels10, R-E-B-E-L-S, 1-0 for 10% off, and you can see all the different options at scriptedjewelry.com. Podcast also brought to you by the Weston Jackson. You can uh, gather at Estelle tonight. That'd be a, a, a great night to do it. Estelle Wine Bar and Bistro. Sip on a creative craft cocktail. Enjoy their curated wine list. The food is just fantastic. It's open for breakfast, lunch, dinner, Sunday brunch. Chef Caden is terrific. His mission is to connect guests with the community through local partnerships. So gather at Estelle tonight. Uh, obviously, you can't plan a uh, a Valentine's Day excursion, you're, you've officially run out of time, but you can plan something for the summer, whether it's uh, to Florida, whether it's to the Caribbean, whether it's to Scotland, California, whatever it may be, get in touch with John Edwards, Regency Travel Incorporated in Memphis. He's part of Virtuoso. It's a worldwide network of travel partners that allows him to supply his clients with added values and unique benefits that are simply not available to other travelers. You call John, you give him some parameters, you give him a budget, and he'll give you options that you can't find on your own. 901-494-3387 or send him an email, jedwards at regencytravel.net. First-time clients save $50 off the first booked trip just by telling John you heard about Regency Travel on the podcast. We're also brought to you by Grenada Nissan. Check out Grenada Nissan. It's just off Interstate 55 in Grenada, Mississippi. They have a complete selection of new and previously owned Nissan vehicles. Go in, test drive one today. Uh, tell Gene and Sandy that you heard about uh, you heard about Grenada Nissan on the Oxford Exxon podcast, and you'll get uh, Rebel Savings on top of the already great deals at Grenada Nissan. It's GrenadaNissanUSA.com. And we're brought to you by Harry Alexander. Harry is an Oxford-based REMAX Legacy Realty agent. He's been in Oxford more than four decades. No one knows the residential and condo market in Oxford better than Harry. Go to his site. He'll prove it to you. HarryAlexander.com. Click on the Properties and Neighborhoods tab. Filter through by what you are looking for, and then send him an email, ha at harryalexander.com. And we're brought to you by Oxford University Bank, OUB, locally owned and operated right here in Oxford. When you deposit money at OUB, that money and the vast majority of the bank's profits go right back into the Oxford community. OUB gives you the comfort of home, all the benefits the big mega banks provide, all the technology and products you can want, all with the personal touch. When you call OUB, you speak directly with a live person, all without having to press 10 buttons, without a five-minute wait. OUB offers its customers the absolute best cash checking account. It's called Casasa, and with Casasa, OUB will pay customers 2.5% interest on their balances up to $50,000. And with Casasa, ATM fees nationwide are refunded. To learn more about OUB, check out liveoxfordbankoxford.com or call 662-234-6668. OUB is FDIC insured. Podcast is brought to you by Mastercuts Lawn and Landscape. Give them a call for a free quote at 662-607-7773. You can also send them an email, 
at info at goldmastercuts.com. We always appreciate when you mention Rebel Grove when you do that because they'll build structures for you, decks, fences, and more, even custom playgrounds, or just sign that contract to take care of your yard all year long with Master Cuts. They also handle plenty of flower bed repair. They're doing that for me next week, uh, along with all the other services that I use them for. So, again, get a free quote, 662-607-7773. Now, Jeffrey Wright on the Patterson and Earhart Hotline. Jeffrey, good morning. Uh, A day that I know you love. I know Valentine's Day is one of your uh, favorite days of the year, correct? Oh, who who could... Who, how could you not be just filled with love whenever you see the side of store-bought chocolates, overpriced flowers, uh, unnecessary gifts just for the sake of trying to not get in trouble? How could you not love a day like today? As a, uh, as a, a text conversation that we had with a bunch of people yesterday, um, competition is a real thing on Valentine's Day. Competition's a real thing, and also let's also let's let's keep it real. What else is a real thing is trying to determine um, what is a lie, and <laughs> what is what is a lie, and what is something that is actually a statement of fact. Because as long here's the deal: if every statement, if every statement that one makes could be taken as fact. I wouldn't be, or uh, excuse me, whoever wouldn't be in a certain predicament. But evidence has suggested that sometimes everything a woman says is not everything she means. So therefore, trying to determine what is and isn't a trap is is quite, quite taxing on the brain. You think this is the holiday version of the am I fat conversation? Oh, my God. Um Yes, yes, okay. I, I think this is... So do you think you're prepared for today? God, I hope so. Okay, fair enough. God, God, I hope Although so. Although, you, you guys were out of town last weekend, right? Yes, that okay. and that was kind of Valentine's Day. And not, well, it wasn't. Not, it was not February 14th, and, and, and no uh-huh. one was in you know situations where they're around other girls. Well, Chase, eh. my answer to that would be I will use the same answer that the good people of the Church of Christ gave me about Good Friday. Uh huh. It is literally just another day. You should celebrate your love <laughs> the exact same each and every day. It does not matter if Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross on this particular day for your sins, essentially encompassing the entire point of your religion. That does not matter. It is no different on October 12th than it is on that day. It's, it's maybe the biggest thing that you and I have never talked about. You know, those uh, those YouTube videos from when you guys were in Switzerland in college mm-hmm. uh, made made its way, and you were you, you were playing the guitar. Mm-hmm. Church of Christ don't use instruments, Jeffrey. I, I feel like you were you, you were causing a problem even right then. Well, you know, um, as I as I pointed out my freshman year uh, when I was told the early church uh, didn't uh, the early church didn't have music, to which I responded, "Well, did the early church have?" indoor plumbing to the early church have air conditioning because we seem to have that here so i don't understand why a guitar means i'm going to hell but indoor plumbing is a-okay all right fair enough i'm uh, convinced whoever started the church of christ was just they couldn't play an instrument but they probably had a pretty good voice and so you play your strings right and so they wanted to show off didn't want the guy coming in with the drum set exactly yeah exactly they, you know, musicians are show-offs but singing is of the lord okay uh, Ole Miss basketball last night goes into Auburn Arena, wins sixty to fifty five, and you know, going into last night, it was more of hey, hold serve, got to go probably find this road win somewhere. I mean, people gave them a whole lot of chances to win outright at Auburn last night. Entire script now has flipped for Ole Miss. They've just sort of got to hold serve and just not screw it up the rest of the way. And frankly, they're playing all of a sudden for maybe a top four seed and potentially a uh, top six, seven type seed in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I thought if you if you actually, if you look at it, I thought the difference between last night and say like the Alabama game, Ole Miss did a great job of making Auburn uncomfortable in doing what they want to do. And Auburn loves to get out into transition. And whereas like a lot of teams like to get, like for instance, Memphis likes to get out in transition, but they like to do it to try to get 
easy layups and whatnot. Auburn likes to get out and transition to get threes and just kind of barrage you with threes. And Ole Miss did an outstanding job. I felt like the entire night taking that away. And you could sense Auburn's frustration the entire night. And I just, I, I, I don't think you can say enough uh, about the job that Kermit Davis has done with this team because this is essentially the exact same team that we saw last year that, that finished last in the, not only, of course, there are no divisions anymore in SEC basketball, but finished last in SEC play. And, I mean, this is, barring some type of meltdown, the likes which I do not expect, he has made this an NCAA tournament team, and uh, you cannot you cannot commend him enough. And really, doing so with the exact same core roster as last year. And then the other thing I thought Ole Miss, Ole Miss, what Ole Miss has done is they built a team that travels really well, and by traveling really well, that helps your metrics so much. Like I just one thing I think that always killed Andy's teams is. He didn't get big wins on the road. It was almost like all the big wins came at home. The goal was to not have bad losses on the road. But, I mean, this team, if you look at it this year, almost every single one of their big wins is away from home. Like Baylor, away from home. Uh, Mississippi State. State, away from home. The Auburn game, away from home. Uh, I mean, even played really well against Butler. I mean, you know, early on before they even kind of yeah. knew how to win, they were sort of still scrambling a little at that point. And now the bigger problem is Butler has turned out to not be what we right. thought they were going to be. But, yes, I mean, early on in the year, yes, that that uh, that was very much the case. And, you know, if you look at – if you're just looking at it from a metric standpoint, one thing that, one thing that used to always hurt Ole Miss, I felt like, under Andy when it came – this time of the year was metrically they didn't stack up. And obviously Andy would point out the schedule was a problem and it it was, but I think a bigger problem was not having the big wins away from home. And and Ole Miss right now has multiple. Yeah. And I mean, Kermit's trying to build a program that does travel and and plays well on the road with different ways that he's going about things Uh, just from a stylistic standpoint, even though that's not necessarily the way this team is, uh, is built from a style standpoint. You mentioned Kermit, and the job he's done at Ole Miss, it's a three-way race right now for SEC Coach of the Year between Rick Barnes, Will Wade, and Kermit Davis. It, how do you measure Barnes? Because they go from like basically worst to first last year. They're picked second, but then now they're a national championship caliber team. They're a Final Four caliber team with no top 100 players. How do you sort of find it? It's almost kind of like hitter versus pitcher for MVP in baseball. I don't know how to compare these three guys as I would try to make a vote for this. My general, when it comes to, when it comes to like coach of the year awards, my general, I guess, default setting is who did more with less. And I think that's exactly what you point out. While no one can argue what Kermit is doing right now is, is anything short of, I don't want to say like a miraculous coaching yeah, yeah. job, but any anything short of on a scale of one to ten, a nine on the coaching job front, then that person probably wears maroon and white, um, or that person just doesn't like Kermit Davis, maybe from from past from past reasons. But at the end of the day, Tennessee has built a national title contender and a legitimate national title contender without a top one hundred player. And they've done it with seniors. With when you watch Tennessee play, they're actually they're one of the they're one of the best watches in college basketball because they are they're so precise. Like they don't screw up, and uh, they're physical. Like all the like all the things that you kind of I think if a if a coach had his dream team. Well, maybe not my dream team because my dream team would basically just look like Cal's. I would just yeah. go get the best players every single year uh, so that I don't have to do a ton of coaching. Uh, that would be nice. Uh, but, like, you know, uh, if you have friends that are in coaching, a lot of their, you know, if they talk about building their dream teams, it's like teams like this. It was the 
the Villanova team last year with Jay Wright, like it's these teams that that are just so precise, so well coached, and uh, have a little more experience and play a little, a little more physical. Tennessee's more physical, obviously, than Villanova was last year, but I I just think that has to ha- that has to be the default. To me, the tiebreaker has to be you got to give the you got to give the nod of the cap to Rick Barnes because. I mean, good God, Chase, an eight, eight, what is it now, a 19-game winning streak? Yeah, and Grant Williams sitting here, a National Player of the Year candidate, when coming out of high school, Tennessee and Boston College were his only two offers that even made any sense in the world. Vanderbilt didn't offer, Virginia didn't offer, and then it was a bunch of just small mid-majors after that. I mean, like, to me, that's that's kind of the, that's kind of the, that has to be the, the kind of the dividing line for me. And then another thing, like, look at it. Do you think Rick Barnes is more happy about what he what he's doing right now, or do you think he's more happy when he goes and looks at Texas? Oh, it's 50-50 because you, you've, you got, like you've now, got to think baby. he's going to spend his life looking at Texas going, yeah. Sh- sh- you know, Shaka getting a lot of mileage out of one season. A lot of mileage. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Um, and I don't fault him. And also, keep in mind with this about Shaka. His wife's rich, so he's good. He doesn't he's going to be rich. His wife's rich. Like, everything's A-OK. He's going he's gonna to go to bed all right tonight, is what you're telling me. He'll be fine. Take a break in our talk with Jeffrey to tell you about Community Mortgage, Oxford, Memphis, Soto County, and Chattanooga. Underwriting and processing is done in Memphis. They're getting local underwriting. Understands your market, a leader in condo financing, and the float down option, which allows you to lock in the current rate. But if rates go down before you close, you get that lower lower rate getting back into house buying season for the year as the spring's coming soon. 662-234-2704 or JLo at communitymtg.com. Jeffrey Wright, Aaron Fitt, and other guests join us on the Patterson and Earhart Hotline. Uh, Patterson and Earhart, are, uh, they specialize in personal injury law and real estate law, but theirs is a general practice that can handle any of your legal needs. When you contact Patterson and Earhart, you speak to one of the partners in the firm, and that's who will handle your case, not some paralegal at a faceless corporate firm. If Patterson and Earhart can't help you, they'll refer you to someone who can. John Calvin Patterson and Wes Earhart are Ole Miss guys. They're local guys, and when you call them, you're going to get one of them on the phone within the same day, guaranteed. So whether you've been injured in a car wreck or have other legal issues, give them a call, 662-526-1992. Or check out their website, PELaws.com. Your initial consultation is free. We'll be uh, telling you about some new uh, promotions and such at Dead Soxie uh, here soon. Probably taping a soft verbal podcast presented by Dead Soxie here in the next few days. Um, Anyway, I'll just tell you this about Dead Soxie. Go to their site, deadsoxie.com. Enter promo code REBELGROVE at checkout. Get 30% off all items, including sale items. And uh, spring around the corner, now would be a good time to start thinking about those showless socks. If you're like me and you can't stand uh, wearing loafers or whatnot without uh, without a sock, you can't stand wearing nothing between you and the shoe, uh, but you want to wear the shoe, this would be a, a perfect solution. They're, they're, they stay cool. They stay up. They're stylish. And um, they're absolutely perfect for the summertime as we get closer to it. DeadSoxy.com, promo code REBELGROVE to save 30% off every item. Podcast is brought to you by Visit Oxford. Visit OxfordMS.com slash events. Check it out for uh, contact info. If you're scrambling a little bit for Valentine's Day today, they can take care of you. You'll see some option there on the calendar of events or just through the uh, different ways to contact restaurants, florist, and more in town to take care of you today. As always, that's visit OxfordMS.com slash events. Now back to Jeffrey Wright on the Patterson Earhart Hotline. Uh, you mentioned this radio station, uh, ran a little of it, had the uh, interview with Ross Bjork, had the town hall meetings uh, starting mm-hmm. this week. I uh, I witnessed one on Monday night. Just overall, where do you kind of fall on the town hall meetings, the rehashing, just kind of the way they're kind of going about it right now versus – just sort of do your job and move on and stop talking about it. I, my first thought was that takes some guts. Okay. And I tip my cap to them because I think it's one thing to sit there and say, okay, we're going to do these town halls. And, um, 
you know, you maybe you maybe think that okay, well, people are a little different in person than they are on Twitter, online, and, and maybe some emails that we've read. So, uh, to me, and you, you can tell me better, obviously, than I than I can. I'm I'm large. I'm primarily basing uh, my impressions on your column as well as uh, your your interview with him. But to me, that host, it wasn't a hostile crowd, but it was certainly – I think it was an angrier crowd than perhaps uh, Ross or Michael were expecting. It's an it, it's it's an engaged crowd because you're if you're passive you're not even going to these meetings you're not taking the time to do this you're not getting in the car when there's no social element there's no food there's no alcohol there's no cash bar there's none of this it's just going and talking and I, I so yeah for half of it it was it, it was a frustrated crowd it was a couple questions that you know if I was up on the stage I'd I'd have been uncomfortable and I, I thought that it wasn't. And, and a lot of fans are going to roll their eyes, and you really have to go to one of these to understand what I'm saying. I, I said I told this news to Neil yesterday. The answers were important, but they were kind of secondary to the attempt. It was the way the setup worked. It was, hey, we're not trying to dodge you. We're not trying to smoke and mirrors you. We're going to put two microphones up at the front of the room. We're going to pass a microphone around the crowd, and I'm just going to stand here and talk to you. And and, and I thought just the way that it was set up was the big thing that eventually yes. – gain them respect with the room because they said, okay, you came here and you didn't try to throw all this other crap at us. You just talked to us. And at the end of the day, for a lot of Ole Miss fans, they just wanted him to talk to them. I think they wanted to talk to him. And I think the other big aspect of it is so many Ole Miss fans are just so frustrated. And they're just, they're angry. They're angry at the NCAA really angry at state and you know they're angry at, at, at ross or most if most people have brains they should be angry at freeze um they should just be angry like at, at everything because they feel like what they've paid for what they've supported has done them wrong and i agree with you i think i think it took guts and i think I think I could make a case for in terms of the in terms of the mood of the moment and the decision that was made, I think I could make a case that these town halls are, are probably one of the best fan relations moves that Ross has done in his tenure because I like you said, man, like you and I have and Neil for how many ever years We have always advocated if you are transparent, if you are honest, if you are forthright, and I understand you can't legitimately – you can't say everything that you might be able to say in an off-the-record conversation or whatnot, but he gave – the answers particularly that he gave you on the podcast, if you were able to – if you were able to use a little bit of listening comprehension – he gave some really solid uh, – I sound like the man he was talking about. gives really solid, really solid answers. <laughs> well, and it's that deal where, look, some people are just going to be pissed until his tenure is over, whether it's in six months or six years or 16 years. But at the end of the day – he and he said this to start the podcast, I mean, to start the, uh, the town hall meeting – He's going to give you an answer, and some people aren't going to like the answer, but at some point you're either going to have to kind of accept that and move on or it's just going to be a thing forever. And that's, 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 I, that's up to the individual fan. You, you asked know? him some tough questions too, and did you feel – like I'll say, it, it. there is also a difference between the conversation that the interviewer is having versus what the, the conversation that the listener will, will uh, digest. But I didn't feel like he dodged a single question in there. No, I thought he was in a in a forthcoming mood to the point that I kind of wish that interview had been in a lighted room in a conference room because I would have been better. Um, because when I kind of went back well, and, and was also editing, not and listening, been after like seven thirty p.m. Well, that's a good point too. I was a little tired, but yeah, you listen to questions for ninety minutes, and this interview is, I mean, to set this up for people because I don't guess I even told this. We're sitting in a Ford Explorer in the back seat, just with a 
a phenomenal a, card. I mean, yeah, just yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. some could make the argument that <laughs> best value car out there on the market. It's very true. Clark Ford, uh, 662 257 1900. Um, with a with a microphone just sitting between us, it's pitch black dark, and I've got a notepad with a phone light on it. So I'm missing questions. I'm ha- I'm trying to figure out the next question without even li- kind of listening to it. When I when I went back, I went, you know, that was the best mood I've seen him in for an interview, and it wasn't wasted, but there was more there if you really had a proper setup for it. I guess is the way to put it. I completely understand that. I mean, it's it's kind of like the difference of. Uh, certainly in radio, nine times out of 10, your best interviews are always going to be in studio in person. Mm-hmm. There is, there's, I don't want to say it's going to happen every time. Cause I, I, there are a couple of people that come to mind that are actually better on the phone. I think than they are in person, maybe because if they're on the phone, uh, they can, a lot of people like to like walk around and to help them think. And so there are, there are some people I think that are better that way. But most people are going to be better in studio, and and as you say, like when we're we're in studio, hey, the lights are on, like you know what I mean, like that that it, it sets up that environment that you're talking about. But I mean, for God's sakes, the guy answered truthfully about the NCAA's investigation process on the record. The guy, um, I thought. I think maybe the biggest nugget that he gave was understanding when an investigation is occurring is uh, is the point of the investigation to find the facts, to punish the wrongdoings, or is there a different target? I thought that was I thought that was a very candid answer to hear on the record because. That's something that, as far as, I guess maybe Jerry Tarkanian said something similar on the record, but um, I haven't heard many administrators say something like that on the record, and I think he's absolutely right. I mean, I think the bigger problem is I don't know how you go about fixing the organization problems, because I think one of the biggest problems that we see with the NCAA is everything is done by a committee and everything, every rule that they come up with, this would be the best example I can, I could give you all of these rules, these complicated rules that don't make sense. They actually make sense. If you think about it in this context, it's the exact result of what you would see is if you bought a, just a group of people in a room that all they do is talk to each other and they come up with all these rules together and it all gets released at the end. It's very similar to like these new golf rules that we're seeing with the US, uh, the USGA and the RNA. Like you got a group of like-minded people that got into a room and started coming up with ideas and there's no like oversight. There's no, there's no, there's nothing to say like, Whatever they came up with, like, that's law. And if you would have, like, an editor in, a, in, in our business, they would throw out a lot of this stuff because they'd be like, listen, this doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. And you have to come up with – I hesitate to say it because I just – in general, committees, committees accomplish so little. They're but echo chambers. You need an editor. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Real world guy. Yes, you need. We've always made the joke for years. We need hand raised guy, or but you need. I don't know what you call the position, but you need an executive. Yeah, got about uh, ninety seconds left with you. We had Aaron Fit on the podcast today. As uh, well, you followed this probably longer than I have. How important is this year for Mike Bianco's tenure as we close? Oh boy, it feels like a big one, doesn't it? It does. Um, Number one I signing actually, class, depending. You know possibly wasted if you don't get to at least a super regional i can't remember what your note was uh this will be the second true freshman to start an opening weekend is that what is that, that is what your correct. note yeah. was mark holloman was one yeah. and then cody satterwhite would have been two but a rain out happened okay so the sad thing was i remember mark holloman's first start yeah 
Um, so that was that was a wonderful trip down memory lane. Thank you for that. Uh-huh. Um, uh, Mark's little brother, also best fourteen year old baseball player I've ever seen. Huh. Um, Matt Holloman. He, good God, the kid could rake. Um, Yes, I think that's exactly it because you had this number one signing class. You were a national seed last year. You didn't get out of your own region. You had Tennessee Tech throwing a right fielder with a nine ERA that shut you down. Um, Lost the regional in 16 at home. I mean, I don't know. It's a postseason sport. Like, I, I don't know how else to say it. Like, it is a postseason sport. And if you are consistently a disappointment in the postseason and really your one exception is the year that you weren't a disappointment in the postseason, but you have basically 18 other examples of being a disappointment. I think it's going to taint your resume. Don't you? There's two, there's two black marks on this thing. One, he's never won a regional away from home. Every time he's won a regional, it's been in Oxford. He hasn't done what most SEC teams do, which is just go kind of take one when they're a two seed sometimes. And then two, it's one super regional since 2009. 2014. I mean, that is that is a that is one black mark in a hell of a rest of a resume, but it's also a hell of a black mark. So it's it's complicated, but and like th- this is side, this is like, why this appears to be that year that flips it one way or the other a little bit for a, a lot of fans. Like by the flip side, take like Tom Izzo. Tom Izzo has lots of disappointing years, considering how good the Michigan State job is, considering how good their talent is, but he is extremely good at making runs because in the end it is a postseason sport and he gets it. Well, the Mississippi State. Yes. Kind of, Mississippi State, regular season-wise, is nowhere near the program that Ole Miss is. They're nowhere near as consistent no, as Ole Miss is, but they've done a better job in the postseason. Opportunistic. Yeah, they are. All right. who uh, Who's on the show today, Jeff? Is we close? Uh, we will have a sex therapist. Uh, Dr. Ooh, Jennifer good. Valley will join the uh, show. So heads up, dudes. Uh, you won't want to miss that. That's 1025 a.m. Of course, you can catch it out on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, Jeff joins live from the road on the first hour. Chris Harrington will talk some Grizzlies. And then, uh, surprise, Eric's actually back in studio today, so I don't have to do the afternoon show. Excellent. Appreciate it, bud. All right, guys. Thanks to Jeffrey for his time and opinions today. I know he had a busy day. He had a long show planned for uh, his actual day job. He gives us this time before he gets his work day started on every Thursday, so appreciate that. Podcast also brought to you by the Blow Dry Bar Oxford. 662-638-3310, the Blow Dry Bar at gmail.com. 1801 Jackson Avenue in Oxford, Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 6. Saturday, 10 to 3, and guys, you're scrambling, you forgot, you didn't take advantage of Valentine's Day, just head on over today. Tell them about rebelgrove.com. They'll give you a discount on one of their very, very popular blowouts. They will take care of you, one of the 2018, or actually the 2018 best new business in Oxford. So uh, treat the special lady of your life there at Blow Dry Bar Oxford. Again, 662-638-3310 there on Jackson Avenue, especially today for Valentine's Day. Podcast also brought to you by Home Two Suites by Hilton in Oxford, 101 South Lamar Boulevard. Uh, give them a call, 662-238-3400. 662-238-3400. Make your reservations for Ole Miss football season. Um, make your reservations for Double Decker weekend. Ought to be a, uh, it's usually a pretty fun weekend in Oxford, and I think there might still be a little bit of availability. Don't hold me to this for uh, Grove Bowl weekend in uh, early April, April the 6th, I think. Uh, Florida will be in town for baseball at the same time. So it's a great place to stay for baseball season, for football season. It's about a mile from uh, the square, about a uh, about a mile from uh, from campus. So it'll be a perfect home base for you. It's pet-friendly, brand-new facility, uh, new restaurants opening up, opening up around it as well. Uh, very convenient. Great staff. You'll love it. 662-238-3400. The Ole Miss women's hoops team back in the pavilion tonight for a matchup with the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Tip-off set for 7 p.m. For tickets, you can visit OleMissTicks.com. The Ole Miss baseball season has arrived. Join the Rebels at Swayze Field on Friday, February the 15th, as they host Wright State at 4 p.m. Tickets can be purchased by visiting OleMissTix.com and the Ole Miss men's basketball team, fresh off a road win at Auburn, return to the Pavilion on Saturday, February the 16th, as they take on Missouri at 2.30 p.m. 
Limited tickets remain and can be purchased by visiting OleMissTicks.com. Podcast is brought to you by GNM Pharmacy. Give them a call at 662-236-2222 for to transfer those medications over. They make it easy. They make it simple. I have done it. They take care of all of it for you, and you're going to get local service. You're also going to get free delivery to your home, to your home, your workplace. You're going to get MedSync to put all your medicine on a schedule and a very easy to use way. And they also have the compound creams to take care of multiple things all at one time. Those is at GNM Pharmacy on South Lamar in Oxford. Again, 662-236-2222. We'll go to uh, Aaron Fit in one minute before we uh, do that. A little bit of news coming out yesterday that, um, let's see. Oh, sorry, got a text. I had to read. Um, Houston Roth, Ole Miss's, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm all over the place all of a sudden. Uh, I'm, I'm reading one, too, that we'll talk about when we're finished. Okay, Houston Roth, um, Tuesday starter, we thought uh, on Tuesday against Arkansas State, was going to be the first guy of the bullpen. Talked about this a little bit yesterday. I'll talk about it more on the message board. I'll talk about it tonight if I do do another video chat that Neil can make fun of. Uh, so, but point being I'm with the – not making fun at all. Well, you're not criticizing. You're making fun. Those, those, are, not, those are not the same thing. I, I'm having fun. Maybe I'm a little jealous. I'm a little jealous of, of the fact that, that that you can sit in front of the camera and do that. I, I, okay. I'm not. I'm not self self. Uh, I told you the big screen kind of freaked me out. I'm just being honest. So yeah, if I saw myself on a big screen, I would. That would be. That would have been the end. That yeah, like been, had had you gotten a tweet and you were like on a Jeffrey size TV. I, I, that'd be the end. No more. No more. I, I would. I, I would be speechless. I would say, oh, oh no, 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 no. Okay. Um, the, the smaller the screen, the more I'm comfortable with it. Okay. So, bearing the lead here, Houston Roth uh, on Tuesday during a pitcher fielder practice, which basically means covering first base, he uh, injured his non-throwing shoulder. Test revealed an AC an AC joint sprain. He tripped and fell, best I can tell from what uh, Ole Miss told me. Mike Bianco is listing him as questionable for the weekend, though I do not expect him to play this weekend. I'll be shocked if he does. And I really don't necessarily expect him to pitch Tuesday either, but we'll get more information on that as the time comes. This is a 100% complete guess, but my guess is that Doug Nikhazy would be next up for that Tuesday start against the Red Wolves, the freshman left-hander that looked pretty good throughout the uh, the preseason. But it's a, it's a blow to Ole Miss, obviously. But I, I'll tell you what, Neil. I don't know how long he's out. The good news here, and there's a couple of good news. I mean, it's been a little bit of Pollyanna, but it's true too, is A, it's not an injury that is going to get worse. It's pain management at this point. Number two, it's not going to affect him once it's healthy. It's not one of those, oh, it's this thing's going to linger and it's whatever. It's the non-throwing shoulder. Had we been talking about a throwing shoulder, we got a whole other situation here. And then three, if he's out a couple weeks, three weeks, it's times he's not throwing. I mean, if nothing else, he's going to be fresher later in the year. So I'm overall, Ole Miss has enough arms. I I don't think this is a big deal, frankly, other than just not having one of your main guys to open the season. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. Um, I think if you have him back by league play, you're okay. Yeah, you got four weeks. You got a month. You know, other guys get some experience. You get to, as you said, get some answers on some guys that maybe you wouldn't have gotten answers on. Um, no, you can look. It's if you're given the option of having the injury happen or not have the injury happen, you you, you choose to not have the injury happen. I'm not. I'm not. Well, I'm of not, course. Yeah. I'm not the guy that, that that says, "Oh, this is a good thing," but it's not the end of the world. And like you said, it's not his throwing shoulder. If it was his throwing shoulder, it would be pretty significant. It's not. And so uh, he'll. Uh, I'll give you another. If you want, if you're looking for silver linings, now this is a little bit. It's not spin. It's not really spin. It's it's true. Sometimes guys don't have a lot left in the tank by the end of the season. His his tank will be a little more full than others. Yeah. At the end of the year. So, you know, this cuz it's it's my understanding is that he's hoping to return by league play. And I think that's a fair if you get him back faster great, but I think that's the the fair assessment of this. Yeah, so you know, we'll see. Not the end of the world. Doesn't have to be the end of the world, and it can end up being a, a can end up being a blessing. It's one of those deals. It's it's like last night. You know, you don't have Blake Henson. That's not good. If you offered Kermit Davis, hey, you can either have Blake Henson or not have Blake Henson. Which way do you want to go? Uh, he would have said, I think I'll go ahead and take Blake Henson. But they might have really helped themselves last night mm-hmm. by 
Now, you know, when, when Luis Rodriguez takes the floor for a few minutes or when you have to use Zach Naylor for a few minutes, um, maybe those guys play with more confidence now. Maybe those guys uh, – I mean, Naylor scored five and rimmed out another three that on a heat check shot that I thought the damn thing was going to fall. And my point is not to steer it from baseball to basketball, but sometimes adversity leads you to discovering things about yourself that you would not have otherwise discovered. Because if Blake Henson plays 27 minutes last night, I dare say that those guys don't play like that. Yeah. So you know, I mean, it 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 doesn't. It, you can you can take a negative and make it positive. I dare say, Chase, that you can take a lemon and make lemonade. You can. So that was obviously something we needed to get out there. Aaron does also mention it during uh, his interview coming up here on the hotline. So uh, we'll do that now. We'll go to Aaron Fit on the Patterson and Earhart hotline. Aaron, thanks for uh, joining me today. Always good to hear from you. We're going to get to plenty of baseball, but you and I are, uh, are our Facebook friends. I've got to ask you. Is there anywhere in the world you did not see in the off season? You were everywhere from uh, Singer- Singapore to really all over. What what was going on? Yeah, you gotta you gotta take advantage of that vacation time when you can get it, right? Yeah, we we uh, got around pretty good. Um, Singapore, Indonesia, we went to Hawaii. Uh, where else did we go? Oh, that we went to South America. You know, Easter Island, uh, Machu Picchu. <laughs> so yeah, we, we touched the bases. Was is that something you've done before? Was it kind of the one time trip or what? No, we we try to travel as much as we can in the off season. So okay. it's, uh, like I said, it's you know I'm out of commission from January through June, so we, we we take it when we can get it. Yeah, you know my my wife gets really frustrated anytime Ole Miss gets really good, and she's worried I might just be you know might make the Omaha trip, even a super regional trip. I mean, it, it's your point though. Any family they know you're just gone. It's, it's just it is what it is. You don't exist for a few months. Yeah, just don't even, you know, actually I watched the Super Bowl at my friend's house and um, and I had to say goodbye to his kids for, for six months, you know, and they were very <laughs> sad, you know, it's going to be a while until Uncle Aaron comes by again, but uh, that's just how it is, you know, it's the reality in this business. <laughs> yeah, so let's get into a little baseball. Ole Miss is going to throw Gunnar Hoagland on Sunday against Wright State. He's only the second true freshman that Mike has ever thrown on the opening weekend of the year, Mark Holloman being the other one in 2003. Uh, you know, you look around the league, and there's so many impact freshmen. You, you've got this weird mix of, and I know different reasons, but Marceau and Hoagland and Ginn and, and Kumar Rocker and Vanderbilt. Is there one common thread, in your opinion? We've kind of been talking about this for a while and coming up with some different reasons between CBAs and teams kind of being more content to let guys walk. But why do you think this past year we did see this influx of first-round talent showing up in college? Well, uh, I just think college baseball has become more and more desirable, you know, for, for these high, high round guys because of the experience that has been created. I mean, there's been so much investment, as, as we all know, and especially in the SEC, um, that you're getting like a much more intense experience than you would get in, in the low minors. You know, if you're going to develop for three years at Ole Miss or LSU, um, you know, there, there's a lot to be said for that. You know, it's just, I think it's, it's common sense. It's just the facilities are awesome. The fan bases are awesome. So, um, you know, I'm sure we'll see a lot more of that going forward. Do you um? I, I guess kind of. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, you follow him much along the way with, with, with Hoagland. He's been really, really impressive. He's the guy that made so much national news uh, his senior year of high school by not walking anybody in the regular season. I think he told me he had uh, six three ball counts during the regular season of his senior year of high school. Hmm. And, and I kind of thought, well, that just means he's overpowered everybody. He's just throwing it down the middle. But he's gotten here, and he hasn't necessarily gotten more fine. He's not necessarily nibbling corners, and he's still being pr- pretty productive. He's a, he's an interesting guy as a first-year player here. He's very polished. Yeah, that, that stat that you threw at us there a minute ago was, was remarkable. They've only thrown one other true freshman in the first weekend. Just shows you, uh, you know, how ready this guy is, and, and certainly that's what he, he stands out for: is, is the command and the competitiveness, and uh, the ability to mix, you know, three pitches for strikes where he wants to. Uh, it's very uncommon for a freshman to, to have that kind of pitch ability, and so you know, even even at 88 to 90, like he was in the fall when I was in there, uh, and I know he can touch better than that, but even even at that velocity, he can be very effective because uh, because he's just got such good feel. What do you kind of make of this team? Because I'm, I'm around them every single day, and the, the storyline here has been, you know, potentially their best regular season in school history was ruined by that Monday against Tennessee Tech. And there's just sort of been this fog over this program for a while as they've lost two straight home regionals. They've only been to one Super Regional since 2009, and that was the year they went to the College World Series in 14. 
but then Mike's one of the most consistent coaches in the league. It, it, it's, it's one of those deals where it seems like fans, they really like this roster, they know they're going to be really good, and then they're almost kind of scared to like them all at the same time. Yeah, I think you know. I think the fans need to need to realize this is going to be a really good team. It's yeah. going to be a really, really good team. Um, you know, I know that they lost some some experienced arms in the rotation, but boy, you got to love the talent coming back. And certainly, uh, I really like the depth of that pitching staff. And I think Will Estridge is going to be a star on Friday nights. And we talked about Oakland, and I, I'm very high on Doug Decay's. He's a lefty. And, you know, once Houston Ross. Uh, gets going, that's that's another weapon. So I'm, I'm not worried at all about the rotation, and I just love the lineup. I mean, there's so much power here, so much experience. They're so good defensively, especially up the middle, you know, with Kessinger at shortstop and, you know, whoever plays second base. I'm not sure how that race is shaken out with, with Adams and Servideo, but those are both good defenders. And, of course, you got, you know, the strongest arm in the country behind the plate, Cooper Johnson, and you got Olenek in center field who can track it down with anybody. And, you know, gindle has got great range in the outfield. I mean, they just have – uh, they have a lot of good players. I mean, there's no other way to look at it. They, they won a lot of games last year, and they're going to win a lot of games this year. Yeah, I'll kind of let you react in, in real time a little bit. They are going to play Servideo at, uh, at second base on uh, Friday night. As long as Kessinger's healthy, you know, he sprained an ankle a couple weeks ago. He uh, he had not run outside as of yesterday, so I'm not 100% sure if he can play, but that's the that's the beauty of Anthony Servideo is he can move over to shortstop if needed, and then you have Adams there at second. But it looks like Servideo has at least won that battle, and then for now – just because of the bat, Tim Elko is uh, in right field over Carl Gindel just because he's hit so well in the uh, in the preseason leading up to now. It's a good problem to have is, is competition, you know, and they've, they've got a lot of it. They've got a lot of depth, uh, which I think gives you a lot of peace of mind. You know, if somebody gets hurt or somebody doesn't perform, um, you know, they've got moving pieces and some versatile guys. Obviously, you know, Olenek is, is, a, is a nice luxury because in a pitch you can play wherever you need him to play, um, you know, and you've, you've got – Cockrell, if he doesn't DH, he could play a corner outfield spot. Um, you know, obviously Dillard could catch if he needed to, you know, or, or play first base if he needed to, really. I mean, you can do anything you want with that guy. So uh, it's just uh, it's just a really neat lineup with, with the way the pieces fit together, and, and it's going to be a fun team to watch. I'm going to go around the league a little bit. Who, who, like, who did Florida piss off? Because I look at their schedule. They've got to go to Vanderbilt, to LSU, to Ole Miss, and to Georgia. I mean, that could be a team that wins the national title but then end up 17-13 and 13 in the SEC and just be trying to host there at one point. Yeah, that's crazy. Wow, to have all those series on the road. Uh, you know, as we know, in the SEC, so much of it depends on what kind of schedule you get. And if you miss the right teams in the division, it, it's a real advantage for you because of that unbalanced schedule. And certainly having to go on the road against, you know, four top ten teams, um, I, I think. I mean, that's, boy, that's daunting. But, uh, and that's a younger team this year, too. They lost some of their experienced guys, so we'll see how they handle that. But you're right, it's a team that has a ton of talent, and by the time we get to June, um, you would imagine that, that experience of going on the road will benefit them, and they're going to be dangerous in the postseason, for sure. Obviously, they've got Dyson, but as I was looking at some mock drafts early on, there's not a lot of draft-eligible SEC arms in this class. There's a lot of position players. It seems much more position player heavy from a draft eligible right now but that's just because there's so many young kids throwing it seems like next year is going to be that wealth that comes up from a draft eligible standpoint so in a lot of ways did you kind of agree that in the sec it could be that kind of fun year where you've got so many young kids taking on new roles and you've kind of got these freshmen and sophomores that down the road we're going to see all over the uh the top part of the draft yeah you're right and i think that trend probably holds nationally too that the scouts that that I've talked to think this is a kind of a weak pitching class in college baseball around the country, but a very strong position player class. So uh, certainly the SEC kind of sets the tone uh, in college baseball. And so, if, you know, and that, that is, I think, I think you're right. I think that's the case this year in the SEC is that a lot of the, the better arms are underclassmen, you know, like, like Tanner Burns, of course, and the sophomores that Florida has, and you know, Emerson Hancock at Georgia, and um, you know, looking around the league, there's a bunch of guys like that. Certainly the freshmen, Landon Marceau and Hoagland and, um, you know, and Kumar Rocker and Vanderbilt. I mean, there's, there's a lot of JT Ginn, even talking about that guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really, really talented, big power arms in, in the freshman and sophomore classes. You, you, you mentioned Vanderbilt. I mean, it seems like everybody is so, so high on them. Is, is there a weakness? I mean, if something goes wrong for that team, what is it? Well, you know, I just think they're so deep that – they're, they're going to find the right combinations, but it may take a little time to figure out what their, their optimal uh, combinations are, especially in the mound. I mean, because you've got three starters back with, with Drake Fellows and Patrick Raby and, and Mason Hickman. And they're all good, but they're, 
you know, maybe don't have as much upside as some of the other guys that are competing for starting jobs like, like Rocker or, or, you know, that King. I mean, those are guys that could conceivably beat out some of those, those older players that are more experienced that, that have, you know, less electric stuff. And so for me, I think that the big question mark is, you know, what combinations do they settle on? And, and I think they'll use the pre toppers to figure that out. Um, I think their lineup is, is a little more stability, you know, more, more kind of known quantities that, that probably won't get beat out. I mean, third base would be the one spot where there's maybe some competition there, but uh, they're, they're just they're very, very deep uh, in, the, in the lineup and on the mound. And I, mean, I have a hard time envisioning a scenario where they are not really, really good. Yeah, you know, we uh, just kind of transitioning into the West a little bit, obviously, with most of uh, the listeners being Ole Miss fans. Ole Miss and LSU missing uh, Vanderbilt this season from a scheduling standpoint. And Ole Miss really, as, as much as you can, hits the goal mine because – they miss Vanderbilt, they miss Florida, and they miss South Carolina, who's kind of been a thorn in their side throughout the years. So the schedule sets up really well for Ole Miss. You know, what's funny about them is the midweek is really hard. They've got the two at Louisville. East Carolina comes in to, to Mississippi for a back-to-back night of playing at Mississippi State and then at Ole Miss. It, it's probably the luxury for Mike Bianco when he does get Houston Roth back or whomever is they're going to kind of run up a lot more even RPI points in the midweek than uh, in, in addition to the SEC season as well. But, you know, they're not really tested on the weekend a ton in the non-conference, but that midweek's pretty stout. No no question. And those are, you know, those games count the same in the RPI as a weekend game. Yeah. You know, the RPI formula doesn't differentiate between playing East Carolina on Tuesday night or on a Friday. So, um, yeah, and to get those guys at home, um, you, you got to like your chances. But that that's that, you're right. That's an important point is, is those midweek games matter. It's one reason that – Arkansas traditionally has, has had some trouble with the RPI because they're so geographically remote and they're not allowed to play a lot of the directional schools in their state. So, um, you know, they wind up having to play teams that are RPI drains on them. So um, I, I think having those kind of midweek games on your schedule is, is a big advantage. Ole Miss goes to Arkansas in a back-to-back week at Arkansas and Missouri. Since you mentioned the Razorbacks, have you did you visit them in the fall? How are they just mentally after the way that thing goes last year? Because I have a hard time – Believe in Dan, Van, you know Dave Van Horn. He probably still is not going to bed without thinking about a pop up in foul territory at this point. Yeah, you, you got to figure that's that's going to haunt them for a while. But um, certainly, you know, you know Dave Van Horn. He's he's hard nosed and he's focused on the task at hand. I'm, I'm sure that 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 he's been able to turn the page and get the, the players too as well. But boy, that was what a heartbreaking, gut wrenching way to lose a national title. Um, I, this team, you know, there certainly have some some uncertainty. Uh, because they lost a lot of those key guys from that team. But you still have three preseason All-Americans, Casey Martin uh, and Hester Kerstad are, are first-teamers for us. And you got Matt Cronin in the back of the bullpen, who's one of the best closers probably in the country. Um, question for me is how the rotation shakes out. You know, can Isaiah Campbell uh, be that Friday guy? He certainly has the stuff, but he's been up and down over the course of his career. Um, you know, you got Kevin Cox going back from Tommy John. Can, can he be, you know, a legitimate weekend starter for you? Um, what were they going to get out of a, a Patrick Wicklander, you know, high-profile high freshman for them. Um, you know, they're going to need some of those newcomers to, to step in and, and hit the ground running. I understand Jacob Kostyshock is actually in their rotation this weekend, which is a fascinating um, X factor for him because that guy's got really good stuff from a, a tough slot with a lot of extension. And uh, if he figures it out, that could really give them an answer that they need. If the SEC has a tendency to get weird sometimes, if it's not Ole Miss or LSU, is Arkansas the best bet to kind of jump up, up uh, jump up in the West? Or, you know, I would say or Mississippi State. Okay, um, that's the one that that you know, again, is an Omaha team last year that that has a decent amount back, and you've got what should be a really good rotation with Ethan Small and you know JT Gann and Keegan James, who had a, a very good summer, kind of took a step forward for them. Um, you still have some nice veteran weapons in the bullpen. Um, Spencer Price, Cole Gordon, those guys are still around. Um, and, of course, you still have Jake Mangum. You know, somehow yeah, he's yeah, still yeah. there. Uh, I mean, that, I think Mangum and, and Rowdy Jordan and, and Elijah McNamee is a chance to be a very good outfield. And, you know, for me, the, the, the biggest question mark would be probably in the infield for those guys, especially at shortstop. Is, is Jordan Westberg going to be that guy? Um, you know, is he ready to, to, to be an everyday shortstop in the SEC? I guess he had a really good fall for him. So um, that's a key piece. And, um, I, I like their team, though. I mean, I really do. I, I think for me, you know, those top four teams, Ole Miss, LSU, Mississippi State, Arkansas, they, they feel like they're, they're a cut above uh, everybody else in, in that division. Although A&M, heck, I mean, we didn't talk about those guys, but yeah. they got power arms like, like always and you know, just a lot of unproven faces in the lineup. So it, it's going to be a dogfight like always. 
Yeah, I think Jake Mangum has about a 960 batting average career against Ole Miss. Uh, they're, they'll be definitely ready for him to move on whenever that eligibility up. I, I think Ryan Olenek is probably the Ole Miss version of that, that everybody goes, hey, that guy's still there. But, yeah, he's still here and still uh, – Still swinging, so I, I like these early season chats to uh, to test you because you always pass these things. Ole Miss gets the uh, the second half of the home and homes with Tulane and Long Beach here in a couple weeks. Uh, regional and national programs that you know, at least have a name to them. What what, what can I what can Ole Miss expect? Uh, anything to either uh, either one of those clubs? Well, they're both for us, you know, outside our our field of sixty four projection, but certainly teams that it, it wouldn't shock you if, if they took that step forward and made a run for regional. I mean, I think Tulane's kind of an interesting sleeper uh, in the American. You know, they, they have some good power arms, some guys that haven't quite put it all together yet to this point in their career, um, but, but have the ability. You know, certainly I think Caleb Roper is, is a nice senior that, that I think could be a, a breakout candidate now. He's got good stuff at the top of that rotation. And, you know, Cody Hosey at third base is another player to watch. Um, you know, they got some, some boppers there in the corner infields. Um, you know, they got uh, – a Jensen in the outfield can, can hit the ball in the park. So they, I think they, they actually have a chance to, to sneak up on some people a little bit. I think people aren't really, don't really have Tulane on the radar because they, they've not been good the last couple of years. But um, I think they're more dangerous than Long Beach. I mean, Long Beach um, feels like they're maybe in a little bit of a rebuilding mode for me. They do have a really good Friday guy with Zach Bayoun who's, who's won a lot of games for them. But um, I, I think that uh, they just don't have as much firepower, certainly as they did a couple of years ago when they were in that super regional. So, uh, offense in particular is a major question mark for Long Beach. This is probably going to sound crazy, and I probably am crazy for asking this, but relative to some other SEC schools, does Ole Miss potentially have a little bit of an RPI problem if they don't kind of get crazy here just with some of the, the teams they're playing down and then missing some of the SEC East powers? I would be, I'd be surprised, you know, if it, if it winds up being a problem. Just any team in the SEC, you know, that wins a lot of conference games like like I expect them to. Um, I think the RPI is going to take care of itself, and certainly, you know, they're not playing any slugs in the, yeah. in the preseason either. I mean, like Long Beach and Tulane. I mean, you got to figure they'll be they could very easily be top 100 RPI teams. You know, that, I don't think they'll be worse than 150. Those, those teams aren't going to aren't going to crush you. And you know, Wright State's the team to beat. Um, you know, in the horizon as usual, that's a, that's a quality series to open up with. So, um, you know, I think Wright State will win a lot of games, and, and that'll help the RPI. Actually, it's one of those kind of sneaky good RPI series against the uh, a mid-major that will probably win its league, you know, because, hey, opposing, opposing winning percentage is, is, is 50% of the RPI yeah. formula. So, you know, even if Wright State plays a softer schedule in conference, if, if they, they win 45 games, then it really helps you in the RPI. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried at all about the RPI, really, for Ole Miss. I think the schedule is, is a pretty good one. Yeah, I was going there next. Wright State finished last season with a, an RPI of number 69. Frankly, they're – their non cons probably a little better this time. They go to that tournament in East Carolina. They got Ole Miss. They got Oklahoma State. Picked to win the Horizon. Yeah, like I said, I think fourth and fourth time in the last five years. A lot of sticks back as I kind of look at them this morning. Did a little quick look. Actually, reading you got your guys' uh, Horizon report for the year. A lot of offense, but then I kind of look at this pitching staff and I, I see where Bear Bellamy's throwing harder up to ninety five or something per your uh, your fall report or or one of those things. A lot of bad stats from last year. When I look at him, I'm almost kind of intrigued for Friday because I feel, well, live arm, right-handed guy. But then I see this, you know, 176 whip, 7 ERA, and, and, and over 300 batting average against from last season. Yeah, it's certainly a guy that I, I would I would characterize as a breakout candidate. You know, he's, he's made a big jump from last year. He was just kind of a, a midweek guy a year ago. And, um, you know, obviously they need him to be a lot better. Um, and they expect him to be. But I think – Daniel Cruiser, also the, the, the junior right-hander who I believe is going to pitch on Saturday, um, he's got good stuff, too. He's kind of 88-92 with a, with, a, with a swing and miss curve ball. So, um, you know, I don't think certainly Wright State is going to have the kind of depth that you'll see in the SEC, but they, they got some got some live arms in that bullpen, too. A couple of a couple other guys that can run into the mid-90s with, with Jake Schrand and, um, and Tyler Linecki. So, you know, they're going to be competitive. There's no question about it. The, the coaching staff does a really good job finding diamonds in the rough out there. Are the bats for real? Peyton Burdick's for real. Yeah. That guy's a really, really good hitter um, in particular. And I think Seth Gray's a nice player coming off a, a good summer in the, in the Cape League. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, I think those two guys in particular are dangerous. You know, you've got a, a fifth-year senior in, in Dak Weatherford uh, who can really run. You know, he's a, I think he's a top-of-the-scales runner. Uh, he could make a difference with a base pass, you know, test that, that Cooper Johnson arm strength a little bit. Um, but uh, – 
And maybe Zane Harris, another, another name to keep an eye on, a big old donkey of a left-handed hitter. I think he's 6'5", 260, something like that. He, 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 can, he can put a charge to the ball, too. So, yeah, I, I, like, their, I like their lineup. Um, I like their pitch. I mean, I, I think they're really a dangerous mid-major team that, frankly, could wind up as, as, a, as a four seed you don't want in your regional or even a three because I think their RPI has been pretty good. Kind of last thing, we didn't mention him to uh, to open up, but what kind of year do you expect from Tyler Keenan? I, I, lo- I looked at some of his stats relative to other freshmen at Ole Miss, and frankly, especially with the, the era we're in from a bat ball standpoint, some of the best under Mike Bianco. He got overshadowed a little bit by Casey Martin from an SEC West standpoint last year, but uh, what are you kind of thinking for uh, Keenan in year two? Oh, I think he's awesome. I mean, you know, he's, he's obviously a, a big boy that is, is, you know, has power, and I think will continue to show more power. Um, as he matures, but I, I really like the the mature plate approach that he's got for a young guy, um, and and you know for a guy his size, he he's, he plays a good third base. I don't think people appreciate how good of a defender he is over there too. So um, yeah, I mean for me he's you know, I remember where we had him on our, our third base power rankings. He might have been top ten or so. I mean he's yeah very high on him. I think he's a, a, an emerging star. Appreciate it, bud, and uh, be safe uh, headed to Arizona. We'll talk to you again. All right, Chase. That was a pleasure. My uh, post-game columns and this podcast, also sponsored by Pinnacle Trust. Pinnacle Trust, based in Madison, Mississippi, represents clients in 24 states, has advisors in three states. It's founded in 1997. Pinnacle Trust provides detailed, specialized investment management, financial planning, retirement planning for individuals and businesses, and much more. At Pinnacle Trust, investing is treated like a commodity, and decisions are made using objective research and information, not emotions. So regardless of your level of wealth, Pinnacle Trust will sit down with you, listen to your goals, study your expenses, and put forth a comprehensive, detailed financial and retirement plan. Cookie-cutter financial planners put you in a box. Pinnacle Trust builds a box just for you. To learn more about Pinnacle Trust, go to Pintrust.com. That's P-I-N-N Trust.com. Mention you heard about Pinnacle Trust on the podcast. You'll get 10% off your first year's fee. So, pretty packed show today. Hope everybody uh, enjoyed Jeffrey and Aaron. We've had a lot of uh, a lot of content up at RebelGrove.com. Your observations. Got video from uh, last night as well, courtesy of one J.G. Tate, uh, Bruce Pearl, Kermit Davis, Brian Tyree. Maybe is that right, Neil? Something like that. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was those three. Yep. Okay. Is that right? All right. That Fair is enough. correct. Uh, also, if you missed any of the stuff earlier in the day, it's been a lot of been a lot of stuff this week. It's been a lot of stuff. Um, we'll be back with our podcast tomorrow. Ole Miss and Wright State kicks off the baseball season at 4 p.m. on Friday. Rain creeping in much more for uh, even Friday. I thought Friday was safe, but now uh, it does not appear so. At least as of 9.04 a.m., we're looking at 70%, 80% chances around tomorrow afternoon. So I might have one of those kicking it off in style with hours and hours and hours at the ballpark and – one of those deals where you better be glad Swayze drains well because even with the rain situation, you you run the risk of losing a game. And what I mean, I don't mean losing it. I mean not playing the game because Wright State's on a travel curfew for Sunday. They're, the game's at 12 because I'm assuming they've got a commercial flight to get back to Ohio uh, later in the day. So just something to kind of keep an eye on as we uh, move forward there. Yeah, there's a lot of rain in the forecast really starting Friday for about a week. If they say Tuesday looks bad too. Tuesday looks awful actually on an early forecast. So I hate to break that to people, but yeah, it is what it is. You, you always do a terrible job early in the year with managing the weather. Yeah, I know. It's not your strong suit. Not my strong suit. Nope. Glad I didn't go to meteorology school. Would yeah. Have been a that would have been a mess. Yeah. All All right, right. we'll look back on that and say wasted. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to uh, Preston Broom. Thanks to Jeffrey. Thanks to, uh, you know, all the Valentine's gods out there and Cupid and everyone else. So uh, appreciate it. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.